I may not be the biggest fan ever of season 11, but even I would agree there are good episodes here. So let's get to ranking them. I took all 22 episodes, snapped my fingers, and half of them mysteriously disappeared. Then it was just a matter of finding the odd man out of the 11 semifinalists. That took a while, but eventually I arrived at the right answer. I think. Here are my top 10 Simpsons episodes from season 11. Little Big Mom is one of those odd ducks where everything I love about it barely has anything to do with the main story. Like everything about Act 1 is awesome. Funny itchy and scratchy opener, Marge being sneaky, basically everything related to their skiing trip. I mean, come on, this is the stupid sexy planners episode, it's kinda gotta be on this countdown. All the other characters get their amusing moments too, like Bart's snowboard lingo, Disco Stu hitting on Marge, Lisa and those deer. It's probably the best Act 1 of Season 11. Unfortunately, there's not much to the rest of the story. There's some fun interplay between Lisa, Homer, and Bart, but otherwise this feels like a knockoff of something like My Sister, My Sitter, or Homer Alone. I don't care one iota about this conflict. Luckily, neither did the writers, and they went with the leper colony ending. This does work as a subversion of the typical I Love Lucy plot, where they're going to teach the boys a lesson. However, if you're squeamish about Homer peeing gags, this isn't going to be the episode for you. Oof, those screams haunt my nightmares. So yeah, while Little Big Mom goes downhill during Act 2, there's more than enough goodwill built up in the first half for it to sneak its way onto the countdown. Faith Off is automatically making this list because of its song. Testify is such an entertaining musical number, easily one of the best of this whole era. Like okay, some of the lyrics are kind of uninspired, but there's so much energy to the performance, it crescendos all the way to the end. Absolutely love this sequence. This was a big year for Christian musical numbers, huh? I wouldn't classify the episode as a one-scene wonder either. Act 1 is jam-packed with memorable moments. Hitting some of that Homer goes to college nostalgia, some fun with that bucket on his head. The animators went above and beyond for this POV shot. Don Cheadle delivers a wonderfully energetic and engaging performance as Brother Faith. He sells that evangelism so well that Bart has the power. This kind of plot suits Bart's character, appealing to both his showmanship and his sense of ego. He's not malicious, he just childishly got swept up in this sensationalism. However, I'm not in love with Act 3, how Homer's subplot basically hijacks Bart's story. Bart's character falls out of focus extremely quickly. On the other hand, this is one of the better instances of a Homer in peril ending. It calls back to Act 1, and Bart gets to use his faith healing to kinda sorta save the day. You can have some cuckoo bananas danger in Act 3, I suppose. Just give the story a little structure. Faith Off is a nice example of Season 11 getting this formula right. This episode felt like an inevitability. With Bart's hyperactivity and the rise of Ritalin in the 90s, an episode like Brother's Little Helper is a natural fit for the series. It's a clever concept for The Simpsons in that we get all that thoughtful satire and social commentary, as well as a mini character study for Bart. As he takes the drugs, we get a sense of his inner monologue and observe how his personality gradually changes. Love this small design change to Bart's eyes by the animators, how such a small change conveys so much about his inner intensity. Then how his pupils get even smaller as he grows more paranoid. Special shout out to this Bart and Lisa scene, how mad she gets when Bart prompts her to leave. Bart stealing a tank is on the extreme side of things, but I would argue this is the kind of plot where the stakes have to be raised in Act 3. It succeeds in demonstrating Bart being out of control, and bookends nicely with all that Act 1 stuff with the school and the firefighters. Also hey, that steroids guy is here! Brother's Little Helper is in that weird category of episodes that I rarely feel like putting on, but when I do, it always beats my expectations. Check it out if you haven't seen it in a while. My only advice is to stop when you get to this moment. Definitely could have done without that Popeye ending. Alright, we got three different segments, gotta go fast. Ready, set, go. First segment is solid, contains some nice atmosphere and wonderful character interactions. This one hits its stride in the middle, when Homer's doing his whole Weekend at Bernie's thing and delivering his suspicious eulogy. Unfortunately, they don't have that much time to crank up the mystery and suspense, but what they have is generally fine. I'm not the biggest fan of the Flanders werewolf reveal, the swerve doesn't add that much, but once again, generally fine. 
The second segment is the best, partially because of that awesome song, partially because Lucy Lawless is the best. She gets that classic, a wizard did it, she kicks comic book guy's ass, that joke about Xena not being able to fly, it almost feels like she and comic book guy overshadow Bart and Lisa in their own segment. Wish we could have seen them using their powers in more interesting ways. Still, as a superhero genre parody, it gets the job done. The third segment is easily the weakest, mostly because it's so dang aimless. It's cool how they connect up Homer's job with messing up Y2K, however, after that point, it's just wandering around Springfield, bumping into random characters, pretty paint by numbers. This Lisa moment is great though, how quickly she picks Marge. I will admit that the ending creeps me out more than it probably should. There's something about that juxtaposition of that song and their heads popping that freaks me out. Welcome to the new millennium, I guess. Guess Who's Coming to Criticize Dinner is a nice little Homer Gets a Job plot with some decent Lisa relationship stuff thrown in. We get so many of Homer's different moods here. That mix of ignorant enthusiasm, general incompetence, and snarky criticism. Personally, my favorite is his incompetence. I love the idea of him writing Screw Flanders repeatedly to fill out his word count, or taking writing ideas from Maggie and the dog. Ed Asner's character has no idea what to do with it. I do always find myself disappointed in the Lisa stuff, in that their dynamic is extremely shallow. They don't have that many scenes together, and there's not enough of Lisa's POV to really be a Homer-Lisa story, like the ending tries to convey. Honestly, a lot of the most memorable moments in this thing are kind of tangential to the plot, like the Homer dummy at work, that weird Uter thing, the Planet Springfield jokes. Remember when everybody used to hate the cable guy? I have trouble getting super excited about this one, because it doesn't exactly hit the highest highs ever. But at the same time, it never pisses me off either. It's the reigning king of inoffensiveness. In a season with a lot of highs and lows, this is that solid and dependable episode that goes down smooth. Bon appetit. Okay, the biggest knock against Days of Wine and Doses is that it's a little on the boring side. It might be because every other season 11 episode is a raging alcoholic in terms of wackiness, and this is a relatively more sober and down to earth affair. But what I appreciate about this one is the character journey it gives to Barney, that such an ironic and cynical season cared enough to give him a legitimate character arc. We get that establishing video of him getting trashed at his birthday, how little his friends actually respect him. Love this Homer joke, by the way. Then in Act 2, Barney struggles to stay sober, butting heads with Homer. I really enjoy how the relationship between Homer and Barney is portrayed, how oblivious Homer is initially, how his support turns to conflict, and how Homer comes around in the end. It's pretty contrived, but I love the idea of Homer saving the day by getting totally hammered, spending the entire climax in a belligerent haze. Very appropriate. It's well plotted too, how Bart and Lisa's B-plot connects up with the finale. The B-plot itself is decent, some amusing little Bart and Lisa arguments and set pieces, it contains a fun twist at the end with an endearing Marge prank. It's solid enough. The only downside to this episode is that Barney's helicopter and coffee shtick wasn't strong enough to carry his status quo change forward. But that's not necessarily this episode's fault. Days of Wine and Doses manages to make me care more about Barney as a character, so as an individual story, this was a success. Grift of the Magi is one of those that's easy to dismiss offhand due to its gimmicky elements, but it really does have a lot going for it. Like Act 1 is ridiculously packed with content. From Bart and Milhouse dressing in drag, Bart's broken coccyx, the Fat Tony scheme, Moe's Wonder Bread shoes, that Mr. Burns play. I never did like that Dr. Stupid. There's so many individual steps to get to the main storyline, but all these somehow work. Each little plot beat is memorable. Then you get some interesting social commentary about the privatization of schools and market research. Act 2 is extremely well paced. I applaud their decision to reveal to the audience what's actually going on. Then getting to follow along with Lisa to uncover the truth. Throw in a scary robot as an additional point of injury. The character designers and animators did a great job with Funzo. We already dislike how the kids were duped, but there's something about his movement, the way his eyes move, that makes us inherently suspicious. Gotta say, Kid First Industries designed quite an impressive robot. The biggest problem with Grift of the Magi is its ending. The caroling scene is a classic, but the writers don't have anywhere to go afterward when they get to the dump. 
They're stuck doing a meta argument with Gary Coleman. There's no actual climax to the story. No, this doesn't count. So while Grift of the Magi kind of goes out with a whimper, at least they did write an ending for it, unlike next year's grifting adventure. So we'll call this a win. You know what gets me about Pygmalion? I actually don't think Mo looks all that great after the plastic surgery. There's like no personality to his new look. He was so much better before. Regardless, I think we all feel insecure about our appearance sometimes, so it's fun to follow along with Mo's journey. His excitement over winning the competition, and his crushing disappointment when seeing the calendar. Throwing himself into the world of plastic surgery, seeing how this surgeon tries to deal with such a project. Find out if Mo can actually land his dream job on a soap opera. Then watch in horror as he ruins everything for himself. The story effortlessly makes us sympathize with Mo, but always makes sure to highlight how bitter and angry this guy is. Carl delivers that joke about feeling bad on the inside, but ends up being very true. Thankfully, they don't actually moralize too much about this character arc. The lesson is pretty obvious. Instead, they fill Act 3 full of soap opera cliches and wacky Homer schemes. With sexy results. I mean, this is an episode that's full of tits. Naturally, you're going to get sexy results. Pygmalion is held back by a couple of issues, like that elephant balloon B-plot that doesn't go anywhere, suspiciously convenient plot elements, and some tired soap opera parody humor. Although I blame all my circuits for that last part. Still, pretty minor issues overall. Pygmalion remains a charming little adventure that seemingly does the impossible. It makes me want to root for Mo. Last Tap Dance in Springfield made it all the way to number two because of three words. Little Vicky Valentine. God, I love this character. Tress McDeal does such an amazing job here. She's so simultaneously upbeat and difficult. Like right from the get-go, when she corrects Marge on her name and then reverts back, you immediately know what's up with her. Talk about an establishing character moment. I love watching Lisa mix it up with her, becoming increasingly frustrated and little Vicky increasingly overbearing. The whole tappa 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 thing is genius. Such an absurdly perfect distillation of vague instructions. As someone who had to learn a little bit of dance during high school marching band, this is extremely well observed. There's so much captivating character stuff, but it's balanced well with some wackier plot elements. Homer's eyes crusting over will always gross me out, but even still, his eye exam adventure is memorable and fun. Then you have the big climactic showdown between Lisa and Lil Vicky, with those automatic tap shoes. This almost feels like a season 3 episode, with all that TV stuff, this elaborate film parody, and the unrelated B-plot. The Barton Millhouse story is honestly kind of dull, doesn't really go anywhere, but it does have some funny wigga moments and that vitamin barn joke. I think if the B-plot were better, this had a shot at the number one spot. But as is, Last Tap Dance in Springfield is an underrated little gem of the Scully years. Yeah, yeah, pretty predictable number one pick for the year. Come on, Behind the Laughter is popular for a reason. I think what really works well about this format bender is how well they integrated it into the fabric of the continuity we already know. That they didn't go the route of the Simpsons all being completely unrelated actors, these are more or less the characters' personalities we know and love, just put through the Hollywood lens. We get Homer bungling his way through a TV pilot, Marge trying to sell diaphragms, Bart slacking off, Lisa writing a tell-all book, even more importantly, the writers avoided inserting themselves into this meta-commentary. They kept the focus on the characters themselves and their hijinks. The behind-the-music format allows them to pack in a ton of different situations, include a lot of Simpsons backstory, while still keeping the audience hooked regarding what's coming next. The voiceover and transitions are ridiculously silly, all these hackneyed analogies and overwrought symbolism. Woodpeckers of mistrust, indeed. I really appreciate the shoutouts to existing Simpsons history, like the Gorge Jump or their questionable music career. It's honestly no wonder that the writers did a bunch of documentary style episodes of the later seasons, because Behind the Laughter proved that The Simpsons still thrives in this format. No angry yawns from this member of the audience, Behind the Laughter was a risk that definitely paid off. Now this is normally where I list off the rankings for all the episodes that just barely missed the countdown, but this time it's just EIEI -E Doe which landed at number 11 overall. 
Kind of like Little Big Mom at number 10, these are both episodes that go cuckoo bananas at the end. Neither are particularly well plotted or structured stories. They both peak somewhere around Act 1. But for me, all of the skiing stuff won out over Homer's glove slap obsession. Uh oh, now I've probably insulted Homer's honor. Let me know in the comments what your favorite episodes of Season 11 are and how you'd rank them. I have pretty much no idea what's overrated and what's underrated at this point, so I'm curious what other people gravitate to. For example, I absolutely hate the boat stuff in the Mansion family, which is why I missed the shortlist, but damn does that episode have some good jokes. Let me know where you land on all these. Up next is the Pandalicious World of Season 12, in which Homer loses a thumb, a crown in his brain, and his dignity. And that's only about half of his problems. Let's just say Homer's gonna have a pretty rough year, and leave it at that. As always, thanks for watching.